an entire world is ready for you to start your career teaching the path to wellness. Mastering the science of mindfulness and the art of coaching to help clients achieve mental, emotional, and physical betterment of life through movement, nutrition, recovery, and regeneration. Because impacting one person impacts a family. Impacting a family impacts a community. And impacting a community impacts the world. Become an NASM certified wellness coach. You are listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and I want to talk a little bit today about glute development. And you're right, I may not be the right person from that perspective to be giving you this information. So what we've done is NASM has started working on a glute development course, and they have brought in two IFBB Olympians to be the brains behind some of this, the ones that are out there doing the work, training the glutes for the stage and also looking a little bit about performance. So it's not just about aesthetics, not just about muscular development, but what is the performance when it comes to the glutes and how how are we supported with that? So I wanna introduce you to a couple of people, one of which you've probably met before on the show, Andre Adams, and he is joined with Dr. Sonny Andrews. Thank you so much for being here, guys, welcome. Hey, hey. thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. (laughs) Yeah, always a pleasure, Andre. Sunny, a pleasure to meet you and to have you on the show. So I'm going to throw it over to y'all and just let you take it for a little bit. Just a little introduction about like who you are professionally, your background, and then let's talk about like getting into some of the course and the blogs and the things that you've been working on, and then we'll get in and talk about the course, but then... Let's just have a teaser episode of what it is that we can do to work the glutes. Sure. I'll kick things off since you guys know me. Um, Andre Adams, NASM Master Trainer and IFBB Pro in the Physique Divisions. And um, again, I'm happy to be back here. Thanks, Rick, for having us. I'm really excited to work on some of these projects on glute development with Dr. Sunny Andrews. So I'll let you go ahead and give uh, give them an intro on yourself. Hey, everyone. So I'm Dr. Sunny Andrews. You guys can just call me Sunny, but I'm an IFBB Wellness Olympian and soon to be um, a Arnold competitor and uh, six weeks, but um, I study general surgery and have a master's in biomedical science and nutrition. And I'd like to think that I'm a glute training expert. <laughs> I would have to agree. They don't call you the glute doctor for nothing. So. <laughs> nice. Let's get, let's get into the mix of this. All right. I want to, I want to talk a little bit more about it and I want to talk like just Take us through a little bit of the what you've been working on. So I know that there are some blogs that have been in in the works. There's course that's in the works. What should we look forward through uh, forward to for these blogs and for the course? And then let's then we'll get into some of the stuff about you know from the time we walk in the door, what are we looking at from the warm up to the mobility drills all the way to exercise selection? Got it. So I think the better question is, what are we not working on lately? (laughs) We've been doing a lot of stuff. You know, we actually just dropped a nice blog for Iron Master 2. Shout out to uh, Brian and Matt over there on glute development, um, which kind of set the foundation for what we're doing here with NASM. In fact, we're in Las Vegas as we speak, shooting with our good friend Ashley Kaltwasser tomorrow to get some content for this NASM glute development course. So we'll definitely have a blog coming out. Uh, We're going to talk about muscular development, but also... Um, you know, how to build the glutes for functional strength, um, injury prevention, postural alignment, all those, all that good stuff that comes along with it. Um, so maybe to your second point, I'll have Sunny kind of kick off when we walk through the door in the gym or we're coaching someone or ourselves, what are the kind of first things we do when we're trying to prepare or warm up for our workouts? I think it starts even before you step into the gym because to have a proper training session for any muscle you're trying to grow, you need to really emphasize your nutrition and your nutritional timing. And anytime I work with any clients or I'm writing a plan for someone, I make sure that they have a 
a higher carb meal before they go in and train and try and figure out what carbs they digest best and try and aim that to be about 90 minutes to 60 minutes before they train so that they have time to digest it and that they're not trying to train on a full stomach. Um, so mm -hmm. that, that happens before you even get to the gym. Mm -hmm. And then I usually try and have some type of mindset training for every program that I'm, I'm writing or coming up with so that when people are in the gym, they already have this mentality of what they're doing, what they're trying to achieve and what they're trying to accomplish with that workout. Sometimes I get a little silly and, and personify the workout and do that kind of stuff. Right. But I think it helps give another layer to the workout. And I mean, I have one workout, it's called pain is your friend or Clydesdale type activities. And they're just silly, but people start getting into this mindset of, oh, I'm going to go train and it's going to be this next level exercise. But then obviously there's all the boring stuff like the stretching and the, <laughs> the warming yeah. up and all that kind of stuff. And that's incredibly important, but things that I think people talk about quite often. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think it's I think it's good to start before you even go into the door, like before you before you even walk in the door of the gym, what have you already done? And if we can lay the groundwork for what a good session is going to look like, uh, both from a nutrition perspective and a mindset perspective, you're laying down some solid foundation there. Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, once we're in the gym, um, the first things you want to do is really work on making sure you have as much possible range of motion. So you might want to stretch, get your hips open up, focus on some mobility. Rick, I know you love uh, corrective exercise. You are the My specialist, man. right? So we're trying <laughs> to, maybe you come in and you foam roll and, and lengthen your TFLs and hamstrings, your piriformis, okay. make sure that you're going to get that movement efficiency you're looking for to target your glutes in this particular case. Gotcha. All right. So we do like some uh, some warm ups. There might be some foam rolling and stretching. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be some warm ups that you may do for the hips regarding activations? Would you would you yeah. do? I don't know, like like kind of a movement prep to start facilitating muscle activation prior to doing he uh, heavier lifts or more complex lifts. Yeah. So, Sunny, what would you normally do to pre-exhaust your glutes going into leg day? So before I train any lower body part, but specifically glutes, um, I do a stretching routine and transition that stretching routine into a body weight circuit. And I use resistance bands and body weight and do things like single leg uh, hip thrusts off of a bench, trying to really get that mind muscle connection going. Because if you're going to try and jump into a heavy glute exercise and they're not warmed up and you're, you have no mind muscle connection, you're, you're going to either get hurt or just, it's going to be a waste of your time. Mm -hmm. So I do things like, um, body squats, just really long eccentric, really just trying to fill your glutes with blood and some, um, abduction work with your, with resistant bands. Like I call them clamshells where you lie on your, yep. your side and do that. And, um, but other, there's there's a whole bunch of things that we've included in the in the protocol, but I think that yeah. they're all aiming towards low weight, obviously body weight or resistance bands, high volume, and you're just really just trying to pre exhaust them, like you said. Right. Yeah, I like I like looking at it where you know if we do core work ahead of time, or if I do some glute activations, I'm I'm basically I'm not necessarily trying to exhaust anything. I'm trying to to smack them and shake them up and say, okay, are you yeah. ready for this? You know, let, let's get in there. Maybe the way you would do with uh, with the boxer going into the ring, like let's go, you know, rattle the cage a little bit. So it's prepped and not necessarily, and pre-exhaustion is a style, right? But there's also something to be said for like, my glutes aren't, I've been sitting on them, right? I've been, I've been, yeah basically putting I've been foam rolling my glutes all day long by sitting on them sitting in a chair and they're not ready they're they're a kind of a phasic muscle they're a little drooped and we're we're trying to 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 facilitate some activation there and I think it's important to do it I think it's important to say hey these are some lighter exercises these are maybe more isolated exercises before we go into more of an integrated movement because you need to get the glutes to participate. And if you don't, sometimes other muscles can jump in there and say, hey, don't worry, I got it. Yeah. And pre-exhaust yeah. may have been the wrong word, but they're they're definitely not to failure exercises. They're just exercises right. that make you feel. I mean, if you do that circuit 
it's very similar to the circuit that I'll do backstage at Olympia before I go on stage, mm-hmm. where you're not training to failure or to be sweating your fake tan off, but it's to have a pump. <laughs> you're, you're basically tra- like training to have a pump. And like you said, wake up the muscles a little bit. And then when you go and do an exercise, even if you go do a compound exercise, if your glutes are the ones that were firing and are all filled, like you can recruit them much more than you could if you just went and did a cold turkey. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of stimulation, right? And Rick, you would appreciate things like um, single leg exercise. So like a single leg balance of reach, maybe even standing on a piece of foam where you're forcing that stabilization. Um, If you've got, so for aesthetic physique goals, you might even want to start by warming up your glute medius and minimus to try and round off, you know, the top outer portion of your glutes if that's a weak point for you. Um, so again, the clamshells, fire hydrants, um, any kind of hip extension, all of those things are good ways to get that stimulus you're looking for before you get into, you know, subsequent training. Now, talk a little bit about because we you mentioned it, but hip mobility and hip range of motion. What are what are we looking at? When when would you say we need to work on some hip mobility with you? And what might some of those exercises look like? I kind of start with those assessments, right? And, and in fact, I'm going to have Sunny share a story we just talked about on Insider. Uh, but if we look at our overhead squat assessment and you have limited range of motion through the hips, you sit all day like us, right? You're probably going to have some hip flexor. Um, issues where you need to stretch and lengthen those as well to get that mobility. Postural alignment, if you've got anterior pelvic tilt or, um, you know, PPT, those are all things that um, you might need to improve to make sure that you can isolate your glutes in an exercise. Um, so, Sunny talked a little bit about the stretching. Uh, I'll I let think you it's kind called of the stretch it. lab. Yeah. The stretch so lab. I yeah. Recently started going to this place called the stretch lab. And I just was thinking it was going to be somewhere where you went and they helped you stretch so you didn't have to do yeah. much. It was much more than that. You stand on this platform and you hold on to this bar and there's like a 3D scanner. And as you do these different movements, they ask you to squat and do deadlifts. And as you're doing these different movements, it tells you which muscles are being recruited more than others, where you have imbalances. And it was yeah. so cool. And then they <laughs> say, all right, we're going to fo- focus your stretch on these muscles so that it's not so tight so that you can recruit your glutes more, for example. And that was for me, they're like, you know, when you do a squat, you're only recruiting out of, if you say like you recruit your glutes a hundred percent, I don't think you're supposed to in a squat, but you're only recruiting them 30%. You're really quad dominant. And I'm like, that is true. (laughs) And they're like, maybe if you stretch your quads out, you can recruit your glutes. I don't squat. I really don't squat at all because of that reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't know it was because of that reason, but now I know, oh, I, I'm not getting the glute workout that I want from squats because I'm too tight. Right. So I, yeah, I was, now I want to go do that every time. (laughs) (laughs) It's amazing. All right. Let me reintroduce you to our audience here. So we've got Dr. Sunny Andrews and we have Andre Adams, both of which are IFBB Olympians. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And I appreciate Mm -hmm. you all taking some time out of the the show and the, the thing that you're doing in Las Vegas this weekend to be here with us to talk about you know, the glute blog that you've been working on with NASM, the glute development course that you're working on with NASM, and then just talking through some glute stuff for us and our listeners here. So I appreciate that. I got I want to talk a little bit about, I mean, it's kind of what you're talking about here where we're, we're discussing really movement efficiency, right? And so you had this really wonderful high tech experience to go through some neuromuscular efficiency and to identify what some of those things are. Uh, Andre, you were talking about the movement assessment and identifying some things with the movement assessment. So how do you go from movement assessment and then identifying neuromuscular efficiencies and then where does the glute training fit in that conversation? Yeah, so I think it's, it's very similar to what we're doing, you know, with our NASM overhead squat assessment or any of our, you know, kinetic chain movement efficiencies where you're looking to isolate and lengthen some of those overactive muscles, right? So Sunny's example, her quads were a little bit dominant in that particular assessment. So maybe foam rolling and stretching those areas before she gets into her, uh, her glute training. Um, that would be my approach for most of it, right? Um, if you're hamstring dominant, definitely want to roll out the biceps femoris, um, your hamstring complex, maybe your TFLs, before you start your actual glute training. Um, That's really what I would look at it for is how can we strengthen the underactive muscles we're trying to 
get this adaptation for, right? We're trying to build our glutes. And then how can we relax or lengthen the overactive muscles? Yeah, I love that. I love that that focus with that. So now let's get in. This is really all anybody cares about for this next part. So, uh, and you know it's true. We get these, uh, <laughs> these questions all the time. What are the best exercises? Or sometimes not even that. What is it the best exercise is usually what you get. If you only had one exercise, uh, I'm not going to put you on the spot like that because my brain doesn't work that way. Like I understand it, but the, the answer really is know, it depends, right? Like there's so many things that are out there. It just depends. But what are, what are, what is your favorite? What are the best exercises? And not just glute max, but we can talk about glute medius and stuff too as well. Yeah, I'm gonna let you go first, Sunny. <laughs> if I had a millimeter added to the circumference of my glutes, every time someone asks me this question, <laughs> I, I would have the biggest glutes in the entire world. <laughs> um, yeah, I. Do you want me to go first? Yeah, I want you to go first. I think I or or we can guess each other's. I'm okay. Like, oh, that's funny. Guess yours. All right. If I only had to pick one, because I know yeah. you have a lot. Hip thrusts. <laughs> Hip thrusts are the are my favorite. Yeah, I can recruit. Okay. <laughs> I can recruit my glutes the most in hip thrusts. Um, but when I traditionally say, all right, what's your favorite? Let me think. Lunges? Close. No, what was it? That's, that's probably number two. <laughs> okay. Step ups? Rear foot nope. elevated. I'll, I'll be honest. Mine's a compound movement, close kinetic chain, if that's a hint. I come from powerlifting, so that should be oh. the way. Oh, that should yeah. be the way. I like deadlifts. That's, uh, yeah. I love deadlifts, so I'm a deadlift oh. guy. But deadlifts are great. I think they're king, but for our goals, right, um, for you, you probably focus more on like an RDO. One yep. question. Um, I think we should we should ask Rick is kind of some of the variations because there's so many right. If we say no. um, a lunge, if we say um, a squat, right? Are we talking sumo squats, Bulgarian split squats? Are we talking back squats, front squats, hack squats? So when we think about um, even just some of the acute variables with a hip thrust, um, what's your favorite? Are we talking barbell loaded, Smith band? Yeah, are your hips in PPT? Pel you know, posterior pelvic yeah. tilt. Good My question. Favorite? Oh. So I, <laughs> I will do my favorite hip thrust would be the a resistance band on my knees, Smith machine, triple contraction. If I do four yeah. sets of that, it's game over. Like <laughs> it's yeah. though I get the best pump from doing that. Um, I don't necessarily, I think I get the best pump, but I don't think I necessarily break the most fibers that usually won't make me sore. Like if I do like six sets of really mm. heavy hip thrusts where I do some, feeder sets and then um try and do a drop set at the end like that's that's like next level but yeah, to get yeah. the most pump the craziest pump is definitely the triple contraction smith machine so rick you know you and i always touch on our mechanisms of hypertrophy remember yeah. last time we met on the physique stuff we talked about adding a fourth one so you've got exercise induced muscle damage right you've right. got mechanical tension metabolic stress and the pump um, so the pump, really, you're not breaking down a ton of tissue, right? There's not a ton of extensive damage being done, but you are getting a lot of mechanical tension. You like to go pretty heavy on your hip thrust. I can go very heavy, yes. She goes, she goes heavy. Don't <laughs> her, she probably do more than I can on a hip thrust, honestly. Can, yeah. Jeez. Um, and you're getting the metabolic stress from the pump and the volume, at the right, of, um, of the exercise. Another thing when you do hypertrophy training, when you get the pump, is you cause angiogenesis. So although you're not breaking down fibers, you're causing there to be more blood that goes to those muscles so that they can get more nutrients and grow more efficiently too. So yes. there, you increase the size of the vessels that then cause tributaries to grow and feed the muscle too. So it is necessary. Nice. So this is a lot of bilateral exercise that you're doing here. Is there place? Is there uh, do, do single leg exercises fit in this continuum or these, maybe, maybe we're just talking about favorites. Does it fit in, in a glute development program? Oh, absolutely. I had yeah, an asymmetry okay. to my glutes and worked very hard to correct it. But my, my favorite glute exercise that when people ask me my three favorite glute exercises, I will always say step ups, because if you go on PubMed and you look at which muscle or which exercise recruits glutes the most and the most out of any other muscle while you're training, it's step ups. It is. So I really? I have been really trying to work on incorporating more step ups into my routine. And I, I really wasn't even recruiting glutes enough when I was doing it. So I had to really work on my form. 
Yeah, and we're going to demonstrate that actually tomorrow. Maybe we'll just do a quick video tonight, but right you know, okay. we, yeah, we could we can do a workshop if you want. There's right? a store here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be on a box. <laughs> but you know, definitely the form, right? The height of the box, so what that elevation is. Are you, you know, tilting the knee past the toe, or are you driving more through the heels and recruiting all your glutes? All those little distinctions make a big difference in um, how step ups uh, can really help develop your glutes. Interesting. So let's let's take this and move into range of motion. So is there an ideal range of motion that we should be looking at when it comes to working through the hips? Is is there a point where too much hip flexion as you're doing your your descent? Is there a too much? Is there an ideal range of motion or like are we are we doing the same thing? It depends and let's work through variety. Are we talking specifically on step up still? Yeah, I was gonna say it totally depends on the exercise. Mm, no, no, let's let's cover let's cover everything. So yes, let's talk all about step ups since yeah. you talked about them. All of the exercises, okay. Which one are we gonna start with? Are we gonna do start alphabetical? With, we'll start with step ups. <laughs> all right, step yeah, up. go step ups. We'll do maybe our top three. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know, I always like to look at it as with any exercise, if you can start the exercise, whether it's a step up or an RDL, with the muscle in a lengthened position where you're getting that full range of motion, you're gonna recruit more muscle fiber. Um, that being said, you know, you also wanna have that range of motion that allows you to consciously squeeze that muscle, uh, contract that muscle as hard as you can. Yeah. If I do step ups and it's too high of a platform and I have to come all the way back down and then take the mm -hmm. tension off of the muscle, I don't think that it's as effective as if I just kind of keep myself in a constant tension and go up and down. So that's a good point, TUT, right? Time under tension. Yeah. That's everything in this world with muscular yeah. development, um, where you're really trying to maximize how much muscle fiber you're tapping into. And again, it's that muscle, uh, mechanical tension, right? Those three mechanisms. So uh, I think that's one of the biggest focuses on anything in bodybuilding. I know, Hani, you're working with Hani Rambod now, one of the uh, legends in the sport in terms of coaching. I don't know what honey has like 20 Olympia titles under his belt, which is ridiculous. Hopefully one more soon. Maybe one more <laughs> soon. He doesn't need a physique guy. <laughs> but you know, his philosophy is like, I think it's the FST seven, right? Yeah. So that's the fashion stretch training. Um, again, shuttling that all that blood flow and, and everything like that. But um, definitely some big techniques that are centered around time and attention with any of these exercises. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's one of the things I was thinking about with the step ups is that mm -hmm. oftentimes when you get somebody where a step is high, when they drop down, they they bounce off the calf to come back up uh, and and then you lose some of that tension. So and, and I think a lot of times in that particular example, what you do is you have people focused more on the step up than focusing on the glute supporting that step up. And what mm -hmm. you're saying with this mind muscle connection, and there's a research article that, that Brad Schoenfeld just posted recently that really does show that when you focus on a muscle during the uh, resistance training of that muscle, it does increase muscle activity. And mm -hmm. so it's actually made it into the acute variable list when you're focusing on muscular development is thinking about and focusing on that muscle. And sometimes it's hard to do when you're bouncing off a, uh, a rear leg on a step up. Right, exactly. So it's gotta, you know, it's gotta be a good fit for you and for your biomechanics. Um, I think another good exercise, maybe two to think about would be an RDL or even okay. a sumo squat. Um, you know, you'll see some athletes, we even like to do deficits, right? Where you get, if you're flexible enough and you feel like you can get a little bit more out of the exercise, some people will mm -hmm. elevate the feet and go to a deficit. Um, and then you're coming up about 90% just to keep it under tension, right? If you stand completely up, now you've kind of lost that mechanical tension. Uh, muscle. So, just another little tip. I'm getting very excited to go train tonight. I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is very cool. Can you talk about the where the role of a uh ppt in doing some of these lifts like an rdl yeah. um maybe a deadlift you know things like that where a posterior pelvic tilt may mm -hmm. have some contribution here i'm thinking maybe let's walk through um hip thrust so when you're at the top of your hip thrust mm -hmm. right if you start just spine and and hips neutral yeah that's kind of like you know the starting point for most people but if you want a little bit more out of it 
Yeah. Right. You have to have a, a PBT at the top of the movement and then hold it too. Yeah. If you really, like I, we were talking about time under tension with hip thrusts, it could be like a two out of 10 in effectiveness. But if you really wait up at the top of the movement and rotate your hips um, and then have a long eccentric movement, it, it turns into a whole different exercise because yeah. you're I, the most force is on your muscles when it's like completely contracted. So that's usually not like the most effective exercise, but if you change it so that you're still constantly, instead of just dropping down the weight, but if you're still putting yourself under tension as you're lowering the barbell when you're doing like a hip thrust, then it, it becomes much more effective. But yeah, the, the posterior tilt, I think if you get out of it, so for me for like rest, pause, hip thrusts, uh, those are those are great because you can recruit the muscles over and over again if the if the box is like the right height but like we said with the step ups if the box is too high and you come all the way down and you have to reposition yourself every time i think it's less effective right that makes sense to me i was even doing just today on the back extension stand where i really just do them for hip extension stands uh, holding onto a plate, posteriorly tip, uh, tipping my pelvis as I come up into it, where I feel like I'm pushing my pelvis into the pads and lifting up. Mm -hmm. So different than just lifting up, right? Like yeah. being very focused on that. So let me go one more time with this. We've got uh, Dr. Sonny Andrews and we have Andre Adams with us today. I've got a couple more questions. I'm going to let you go. Uh, get your training in because I know you're chomping at the bit to do it, Sonny. So <laughs> let's do. Uh, the, let's talk about um, two things. So I just want I want to lay it out. What I want to address is: Can we talk about volume and frequency? And then, Sonny, if you could, because this is based on the blog that I read, if you could talk about the SRA curve, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, you want to go SRA first, and we'll go volume and frequency. Okay, so with the SRA curve, um, you're going to... What is it? Let's define the acronym, right? So is that's your stress recovery adaptation, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're going to have the curve be the most effective, you have to have enough... Um, you put your body under enough stress for it to even be activated. So mm. obviously, you're going to have to find a, a, an amount that's going to give you... Uh, an activation so that you're going to even need to recover. Mm -hmm. So you're going to put yourself under stress. That's the exercise. That's the time under tension. That's the force. That's the, um, I mean, obviously your form is important to you because that's that too. So that's the, if you think of, I don't know where my hand is. There it goes. So like <laughs> that's <the> graph, <laughs> that, that part is where you're going to have a descent in the curve. If you're trying mm -hmm. to look at it that way. Um, recovery is the time when you're resting in between your workouts. And that's going to depend, that length of time is going to depend on your sleep, on your food, mm. your nutrition, and also on how much of the stress you put your body under. So you want to make sure that if your, your stress response or stimulus is too great, and it's going to cause your rest response or rest time to need to be much longer, you're going to mess up your curve. So like, let's say how, the ideally you could go through three different of those cycles in a week, if you do that correctly. Um, but okay. if you have a stress response that's going to cause you to need to have an extended period of time for your rest, and you need to rest four days instead of two, then you can only fit in two cycles and you mess up the, the curve. Mm -hmm. um, and then I can go on to adaptation, which is the last part where you come back up before you're ready to work out again. And that's the adaptation. And that's basically just that hopefully after you've rested that your your muscles have built a stronger system than they were before. Um, so you break them down, you rest, you build them back up and that's the adaptation. Right. Gotcha. So, so, you're, so you're doing this little down and up, but you're doing it at a trajectory that's hopefully elevating, right? Exactly, yes. Everything's strategic. Rick, I would, I would equate it back to like our set principle, right? So specific yeah. adaptation to impose demands. And you've got that uh, muscle protein synthesis happening in there. And to Sonny's point, if you're not getting enough stress or demand placed on the muscle or you're not breaking down enough tissue, um, you're, you're probably not going to get that adaptation. So it's a sweet spot. Too much, you push that recovery period out farther than you would like. 
not enough. You're just not um, going to get the adaptation you're looking for. Gotcha. So when it comes to doing this now, because this goes hand in hand with the question about training volume and frequency. Yeah. So uh, it, is there um, is there a sweet spot for frequency, and and does it matter for beginner, intermediate, advanced? What that looks like. I'll go. I'll go beginner, intermediate. She's gonna go advanced. Okay. <laughs> okay. Beginner, intermediate. You know, I'm thinking about kind of my day to day clients that are maybe non competitors looking for, you know, some functional strength improvements or postural improvements. Uh, we usually target about twice a week, but again, it can, it can vary wildly depending on their goal. Um, I think when you go around and uh, survey a lot of people, especially women and ask why they want to train glutes, the number one response you typically get is an aesthetic goal. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to balance those two dichotomies, right? Is it functional um, performance or is it purely aesthetic? Obviously um, we don't want to throw you know, your body out of, out of uh, alignment or out of whack either. So I would start maybe twice a week, but for more advanced training, as many as four, <laughs> five, five, six, yeah. you know, you could train your glutes, but she's an advanced times. athlete. Yeah. And it's, and it took, a, right. oh, it took some time to work up to training four times a week. And mm -hmm. you can't train four times a week unless you're having adequate, you know, recovery. Really. Mm -hmm. It's, it's quite, you 100%. have to be <laughs> very, <laughs> Uh, I don't want to say pampered, but you really do need to take care yeah. of yourself when you're not training if you're going to try and make growth or change at all if you're training four to five times a week. And your split, right. split is strategic too, right? Oh, my split's quads right. Yeah. and a little bit of glutes and then, yeah. yeah. I only have two heavy glute days and then I have three other touch-up, you could call them touch-up glute days. Right. So, gotcha. And it's high volume. Right now, I don't really train glutes anything less than... I think 10 reps is the lowest I go. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's usually a very high volume between like, there's some work, some exercises, like the abduction work I do mm -hmm. is between 20 to 15 reps. Some cable work okay. is like 20 reps, but most of the time it's between 10 to 15. Okay. What kind of sets are people looking at if they're doing these rep ranges? So for someone who's, in my opinion, when I was starting, people I train that are beginning, I think, and you really want to make changes and be very sore. If you train two times a week, you can do a set of hip thrusts that are like six sets. Um, yeah, okay. You, if you, you know, you want to put yourself through the ringer and see changes, could you make, I think you can make growth with four sets, but if I'm going to be giving someone my honest opinion about a very rigorous glute training program, I'll bump up and I don't start, I won't say I'll oh, start at, at six sets. It's like I will adjust people's sets week to week. And, you know, instead of doing increasing weight all the time, sometimes it's better to just increase your reps or, or not increase your reps, increase your sets. Set volume, yeah. 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 Hey, you know what I'm hearing, Rick, is one of my favorite terms, progressive overloading. <laughs> yeah. You know, hey, we did a whole podcast on that. So, we did. you know, when we think about what tools do we have to progressive overload? Um, so in the NASM OPT model, we've got our, you know, five different stages. For the purposes of a physique goal, we're pretty much training primarily in that muscular development phase. And then or, over the course of so many weeks or prep, we can progressively overload our intensity, our loading, right? So the weight, the amount of sets, volume. Um, we can play with the timing or the cadence of our sets. So definitely a lot of different tools to keep you progressing without necessarily adding a ton of weight or getting outside that rep range you're looking for. All right. I got one more big question to ask and then we can we can wrap it up. But I get the question a lot, so I'm going to ask it to you. Uh, can I work out when I'm sore? If my glutes are sore, can I do still do glute days or should I wait until I'm not sore? What's your rule of thumb? 90th percentile or 90th, better? Yeah, I, yeah, I'd say unless you're you're better than 90 percent recovered, it's really not effective. Okay. I agree. You're nice. just messing with your recovery period at that point. So it could be counterproductive to your growth. Oh, I'm so happy you said that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. 
Y'all, I'm going to let you get back to it. I know that you have a workout that you're going to get in tonight and you have a whole day uh, doing shoots where you are showing people how to do these things. And for those of us who get the course, we will be able to see what those exercises look like that you'll be shooting tomorrow. So uh, thank you so much, Andre and Sonny, for being here with us. Can you just let people know anything you want them to leave with, but it should also include how they can find you. So social media, things like that. Absolutely. I would say keep a lookout for Sunny at the Arnold in six, six and a half weeks, whatever we are now. Yes. Congratulations uh, on that, by the way, Sunny. So Thank I'll, you. I'll definitely be tuned in. I'll probably be there. But, um, you know, for me, definitely find me on Instagram, uh, Andre Adams underscore official or Andre Adams official dot com. Um, and then check us both out. We both got a bunch of cool shreds and transformation challenges. I think you just started a posing challenge, too, right? Yeah. It's a course. It's a, it's a course. course. I'm doing an yeah. Arnold prep challenge right now, mm -hmm. which is cool nice. because I have a whole community of people that are doing the same workouts that I've made for this prep. Yeah. And then, I mean, everyone has a little bit different goals. So I'm doing everyone's nutrition a little bit differently, but it's cool to be in prep. I feel like I'm in prep with all of these different yeah. people. It's very cool. It's time yeah, to Did I say cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And your Instagram? Just, uh, my Instagram yeah. handle is Dr. Sunny Andrews. Um, and What's then I've been posting that? on my YouTube channel more, which is Sunny Andrews. Okay. Um, I've been posting my workouts and um, I actually have to go do that right now. I have one to post today. <laughs> gotcha. Go. All right, cool. Well, I do encourage everyone to follow and to definitely see Andre and to see why Dr. Sunny Andrews is also called the glute doctor. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's definitely on display and we understand why you were tapped to uh, help author this course. So thank you so much for what you've done, the support that you've given us at NASM and for being on the show. Thank you for listening. For those of you who are with us, make sure if you have questions for me, reach out to me. You can do so on Instagram at dr.rickrichie, and you can also hit me up on email rick.richie, R-I-C-H-E-Y, at nasm.org. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.